lesson, let me just say I appreciate uh, this opportunity to preach the gospel uh, here at uh, Rose Avenue. And uh, first time I've been in California in 50 years. And uh, when I was here before, I wasn't a Christian. I was a, a Marine. Uh, and there were a lot of orange groves in Orange County back then. But uh, it's good to be back, sort of, and I'm glad that uh, I'm a Christian this time back and uh, able to preach the gospel to you. And uh, again, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to do so. I first met uh, Thomas at the John Wayne Airport about 11 o'clock on Friday morning. But we have known one another for several years in connection with the Answering Religious Error uh, live stream program. And we've come to know and I think love and respect one another. I, I know one way is true. I, I, I'm sure the other way is true also. And uh, form a good relationship with his younger son, Joshua. I haven't met Jonathan or had any kind of uh, connection with him yet. But uh, good to meet Terry, uh, Thomas is inspiration in life, I know, man. Good to have met the elders yesterday, and, uh, and, and good to see all of you today. Uh, well, I guess Jerry and Janice I met on Friday, <coughs> but uh, Frank and Judy I met yesterday, and their daughters, Brittany and Jasmine, and it was good to, good to get to know them. And I kind of got to know the rest of you by getting to know the others and uh, their families. And so anyway, it's good to shake hands with uh, more of you this morning and I hope that we can uh, develop a, a rapport uh, this week that, that, that when we uh, leave, it'll be like we've known one another for years. And so uh, let me say this before I start. Jerry pretty much preached my lesson this morning in the Bible class with help from Frank and others. Uh, but we're going to do it anyway, and I think that it will complement the Bible class a good deal. And so we're going to start with uh, an, overview, an overview of the Bible this morning. This is going to be our first lesson, an overview of the Bible, uh, the Holy Book Divine, as we just uh, as we just sang. And what I'm going to try to do is is uh, put into this lesson basically what we were talking about the last few minutes of the uh, lesson in Colossians, and that is how everything worked together, the fact that God revealed without revealing his eternal purpose. He, he revealed it, but so uh, in such a way that it was not as clear as it now is to us because we've got the benefit, of course, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and of course, the apostles uh, work with the Holy Spirit.
little mechanical uh, problem there. Uh, operator error, we'll just call it that. Uh, my battery, I let my battery run low and I haven't gotten it fully charged yet, and so maybe we can get that taken care of uh, before the evening is, uh, before the week is over. And so uh, we're going to look at, at an overview of the Bible to give everybody a pretty good idea of the big picture and, uh, and how everything kind of came together and how God uh, worked out his eternal purpose and the people that he used in uh, bringing about uh, his eternal purpose. And uh, so we're going to begin with uh, Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Titus, written by Paul, apparently between his first and second imprisonments, uh, also between first and second Timothy. And uh, and so he says here in verses 1 and 2 of the book of Titus, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the earth, uh, faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which, according, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. So here's a, a promise that God made before the ages began. Uh, now let me just stop here and say, I'm going to inundate you with scripture this week. And that is for the purpose of helping you to uh, uh, internalize it. Uh, so that you can uh, put everything together as you, as you learn it and add the things that you learn to the body of knowledge that you gained this, this week and, and allow this, of course, to... Uh, supplement the knowledge that you already have. But God made a promise before the ages began, and this promise had to do with eternal life. Well, God, who never lies, promised this eternal life before the ages began. But to whom did he promise it? There was nobody there but him and the, and the, uh, and the Word and the Spirit. And to whom did he promise it? This is answered in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. For Paul wrote to Timothy, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel uh, by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So God gave us his own purpose and grace, and he gave it to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Comparing this passage with the one in Titus, then we can see that his purpose was to give us eternal life, but he put that promise in trust. Uh, he didn't give it to us immediately. He put it in trust, like somebody might leave, uh, leave money to a, uh, a child in a will, but their child is still young, and so they put it in trust. So that when the child reaches age 21 or, or finally gets married or whatever conditions are in the will, then they have access to that money. It is in trust until then. And so this eternal, uh, eternal life that God has promised us was in trust in Jesus Christ. And all those who trusted God throughout the patriarchal and mosaic ages, though they knew nothing of Christ, and all those who in this, under the new covenant, trust in Christ, then we have access to that eternal life which was held in trust for us. And so that's what, that's what the Bible is all about. That's what the, uh, the gospel is all about. In Ephesians 3, verses 8 through 12, Paul mentions this to the church at Ephesus. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Now again, we talked about the mystery in the Bible class this morning. It wasn't a mystery in that it was completely misunderstood, but it wasn't fully revealed. God revealed, God hinted at it, and, uh, and left us hints at it, and 
when the apostles uh, were baptized with the Holy Spirit and as they laid hands on others and, and there were apostles and prophets to go out and preach the gospel, they put those pieces together. And so what were really jigsaw puzzle pieces, uh, they put together so that, so that man could see the, the entire picture. And so that's why we're going to study lessons like this today. To help us put together the bits of knowledge that we have gained in our studies of other portions of Scripture. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might, be, might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. There are several passages in Paul's writings where he seems to show knowledge of the wisdom of Solomon. And there, this is one of them. The heart of the present passage is verse 10, which is one of the New Testament's most powerful statements of the reason for the church's existence. The rulers and authorities must be confronted with God's wisdom in all its rich variety, and this is to happen through the church. Not, we should quickly add, through what the church says so much, though that, that is vital as well, rather through what the church is. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Namely, the community in which men and women and children in every race, color, social, culture, background come together in glad worship of the true God. Now let me just say, uh, since it mentioned every race there, I, I believe that the multi-race idea is a human construct. I like the song, the gospel is for all, of one the Lord has made the race. There's only one race of men, and that's the human race. There may be different ethnicities, different colors of skin, but it's just, it's just one race. We're all in the same boat together. We've all got to run the same race. And, uh, and, and so I just want to say that because I, I just read what it said, where it says every race. There's only one race. But the uh, rulers and authorities look at the church and they see the eternal wisdom of God. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Now, I believe the King James says he, the eternal purpose that he pur purposed in Christ Jesus. The New King James says realized in Christ Jesus. I'm not sure about the, the Greek word, but both ideas are the same. He purposed it in Christ Jesus, and now he has realized it in Christ Jesus. It has come to fruition with the preaching of the apostles and prophets. And so all the blessings of God wanted to bestow upon man, including eternal life, have always been held in reserve in Christ. And when we enter into Christ, we are recipients of those blessings. And so since he purposed it before the ages began, that is in eternity past, <coughs> it was his eternal purpose to give unto us who are in, or who will later choose to be in Christ Jesus. And so the gospel is for all, past, present, and future. And so we need to bring people in, not just into Rose Avenue, but we need to bring people into the body of Christ. And it's up to us. It's not us who, not now when, as some have said. It's up to the Lord's people to teach His Word to those with whom they come into contact, uh, wherever they may be, just because you don't know them or, or they don't live close to you. You, you know, you've got the uh, access to the internet and uh, you can talk to people on the internet and uh, via email and Facebook and uh, all of these uh, technologies are available out there that are so misused for personal gain, but they could be used for the furtherance of the gospel. In 1 Peter chapter 1, and verses 10 through 12, uh, this is the one that Frank commented on. I thought he was going to steal my thunder here. He didn't quite make the point I'm going to uh, make at the end of this reading, but uh, to me it's an interesting point. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be, uh, that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person 
For a time, the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. They had this information and they wrote that down, but they didn't understand what it was all about. Remember when Philip joined himself to the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch and the Ethiopian eunuch is reading from the scroll of Isaiah and Philip shows up and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how can I? He said, some men should guide me. Well, even, even Isaiah didn't understand what he was writing. And so how can we expect to understand what he was, write, what he was writing if we don't have the uh, benefit of studying the New Testament scriptures, see what the apostles and prophets had to say. And so Philip began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And so Philip revealed, he's talking about Jesus there. And the, the Ethiopian eunuch then was baptized. It was revealed to them, he goes on, it was revealed to them, those prophets, that they were serving not themselves, but you, Christians. In the, in the things that, you, that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So all down through the ages, even the angels were wondering what this was all about. I kind of picture them looking over God's shoulders uh, and, and, and watching the development of things during the patriarchal and mosaic age and, and, and seeing what, uh, what God was uh, doing through Moses and through Joshua and through Elijah and Elisha and all these prophets and scratching their heads, you know, what's all this about? But when the church was established, they said, ah, that was it. And they did see the manifold wisdom of God. And so many people out there just don't know what it's all about because they haven't come to understand it's all about the, the church, not just the local church, but the universal church, the body of Christ, being in the body of Christ, or being in Christ, which is the same thing, where all spiritual blessings are, including the blessing of eternal life. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, we have... The thematic statement of Moses. This is the theme of the Bible. God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. When Adam and Eve sinned, their amity or friendship with God was destroyed by their amity with the serpent. But God was going to turn humanity against the serpent to some extent and bring man back into amity with himself. The woman's seed, offspring, obviously referring to Jesus, would make this possible by bruising the head of the serpent, even though the serpent would first bruise his heel. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan bruised his heel. And I think Satan probably thought, I've got him now. I've done got him on the cross. But then Jesus was resurrected. And Satan's head was, was crushed. And is still being crushed today through the preaching of the gospel. And in verse seven, uh, Genesis 17 and verse 7, God told Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant uh, to God, to you, and to your offspring after you. So later God made a covenant with Abram to bless all families, Genesis 12, verse 3, and all nations, Genesis 22, verse 18, in his seed or offspring. God made this covenant with Abraham at this time and with his offspring at a later time. Keep this in mind. We'll come back to it in a moment. Now, in Galatians, Paul is talking about this uh, promise to Abraham. Galatians 3.16. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, uh, re uh, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. And that was the same thing in Genesis 3.15. The offspring of the woman is Christ. You might say, well, aren't all people the offspring of the woman? Well, yeah. 
But Jesus is uniquely the offspring of a woman in that he had no earthly father. Uh, he had an earthly grandfather, but only a maternal grandfather. He didn't have a paternal grandfather. Because he had to have a, a physical uh, uh, genetic father in order to have a, a, uh, a genetic grandfather or a paternal grandfather. So in Genesis 22 18, Jesus or God was not speaking of Isaac, but of Jesus Christ. Isaac was a type of the, uh, the ultimate offspring of Abraham. And, but he wasn't the offspring under consideration because Paul goes on in Galatians chapter 3 and explains that uh, and he even says it here and to your offspring who is Christ not Isaac and so we see that a lot where a type is prophesied but uh, the fulfillment truly is in the antitype and so Isaac was a, a type a prophetic type and Jesus Christ was the antitype corresponding to that type. And so Isaac, in the purposes there, uh, stood for Christ. Uh, and so God had Christ in mind. Abraham couldn't know that. Uh, but God knew that. And of course, God has revealed that to us through Paul and other apostles and prophets. Back in Genesis chapter 15, now, in verses 13 through 16. Then God said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring, and here it's plural, and it is talking about the nation of Israel, for you, uh, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. This refers not only to Egypt, but to everywhere that they really lived after they left Canaan. They were... Uh, Afflicted before they went to Egypt. And then God called them out of Egypt. And, uh, and Matthew uses that as a type of God uh, calling Jesus out of Egypt after the visit of the wise men. So offspring here is intended to be plural. It means Abraham's physical descendants through Isaac and Jacob as later revealed. The 400 years would be expired when the people of Israel left under the leadership of Moses. Now, and then he says, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. This would be Egypt at the time that they were called out. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. Abraham lived to the age of 175 years uh, old. And so he's letting him know that. So after Abraham came Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. God used Joseph as the primary means of getting Israel from Canaan to Egypt so they could increase in numbers without being influenced by the evil nations in Canaan, especially the Amorites. And we'll see that in just a moment. Thirteen years after Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, he stood before Pharaoh and interpreted his dreams. He was rewarded by being put over everyone but Pharaoh himself. Eventually, his entire family moved to Egypt. This was by the providence of God. And we see this in uh, late in Genesis, and we'll look at that in just a moment. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So after the iniquity of the Amorites was complete, complete, which would be 400 years, then God would raise up Moses and bring them back. And so uh, both Joseph and Moses were used providentially by God, Joseph to take them over, and Moses to bring them to bring them back. In Genesis chapter 45, we have a conversation between Joseph and his brothers. He has already had some dealings with them as in his position, uh, second only to Pharaoh. They don't know who he is, but he finally reveals himself. And so here in Genesis 45, verses 4 and 5, Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to
to preserve life. So Joseph understood what was going on. God was in control and could have prevented the famine from occurring. But I'm convinced that God caused the famine just as he caused the, the plagues against Egypt. And, uh, and he caused it for this purpose so that the Canaanites, or so that the Israelites would leave Canaan as the Amorites increased in their wickedness, they might have influenced the, uh, the Israelites. And so God removed them from that influence, took them over to Egypt. The Egyptians would not have anything to do with them. Uh, and so they gave them their own land, the land of Goshen. And, uh, and so they grew and, pres and were preserved over, over there. And, and Isaac seemed to appreciate that. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God used the free decisions of Joseph's brothers, Potiphar's wife, Potiphar, the jailer, and Pharaoh to accomplish his will. He gave Joseph the dreams and fulfilled them to prepare Joseph for the dreams he would later give to the butler, the baker, and Pharaoh. By accurately interpreting the dreams of the butler and the baker, the butler later recommended Joseph to Pharaoh as an interpreter of dreams. Uh, the baker didn't recommend him because he died as a result of the interpretation of his dream. Uh, but uh, it's nearly over. The famine is, uh, has five years, five years left to it. Now in Genesis 45, seven through eight, he continues, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord and the Lord and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. In Genesis 50, verses 18 through 20, after J Jacob died, his brothers still fearful that Joseph might uh, punish them for what they did. So his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So the Israelites again increased in number and maintained their traditions and their uh, identity since the Egyptians would not allow them to integrate. They also kept God and his promises in mind. Joseph never forgot his roots, though he was second only to Pharaoh. In Deuteronomy 26 and verse 5, Moses makes reference to this, and he says, You shall make response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my father. I think this was a part of the, uh, the Passover ceremony. This was supposed to be uh, told to their kids. A wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. And there he became a nation great, mighty, and populous. So Moses was used by God to deliver the Israelites from captivity and lead them across the, the wilderness. God then used Joshua to lead them into uh, in over, uh, overthrowing the wicked nations, including those evil Amorites, and settling the land. For some years, for the decades or centuries, God raised up in succession a series of judges or deliverers to deal with the trouble caused by the various remnant nations that Israel failed to eradicate. But the time came when they wanted a king. While God had already designated Judah as the royal tribe, the first king he gave them was Saul, a real man's man. Uh, Saul, the son of Kish, tribe of Benjamin, as was Saul of Tarsus. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a major disappointment, which God foreknew since he had made Judah the royal tribe through the Messiah, uh, through whom the Messiah would come. When Saul was killed in battle, 
David ascended the throne and God promised that his descendant would be the Messiah. I think we talked about that in, in Bible class uh, this morning uh, also. Now, the entire time that David waited to ascend the throne, Job, uh, Saul was trying to kill him. He was jealous of him. Tried to kill him. David had opportunities to kill him. His, his friends said, why don't you kill him? He said, no, he's the Lord's anointing. And when the Lord gets through with him, he'll take him out, and then I'll, then I'll step up. And that's what happened. Saul and his son Jonathan were killed by the Philistines. And so then David took the, uh, took the throne. In Genesis 49, verses 9 through 10, is where Joseph mentions the fact that Judah would be the royal tribe. Judah is a lion's cub from the prey, my son. You have gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, for the ruler's staff, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, or until Shiloh comes. And to him, Shiloh, the Messiah, shall be the obedience of the peoples. So in prophesying the future and fortunes of the twelve tribes, Judah identifies, uh, J J Jacob identifies Judah as the future royal tribe. Although the king comes from the tribe of Benjamin, Saul, the first king, God takes it from him and gives it to the house of David. In 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13, Samuel says to David, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So here again is one of those prophecies where the type was first thought to be intended, but it's really the antitype. And so Solomon was a type of Christ. Christ is the antitype of Solomon. Solomon's kingdom did not last forever, but the kingdom of Jesus would. And it was a separate kingdom. The kingdom uh, over which David and his son ruled was a, a physical kingdom, a national kingdom. But the kingdom over which, which Jesus established and over which he reigns is a spiritual kingdom. So again, this was the initial fulfillment of the prophecy of Solomon when he became a prophetic type of Jesus. Because the expected secondary fulfillment it was long believed by the Jews that Messiah would be the son of David. And so they seemed to understand that there was to be a secondary fulfillment, that there was to be an antitype. Probably came to this conclusion after Solomon died. Well, he must be pointing to somebody still in the future. And so David was long recognized, uh, or the son of David, long recognized as a reference to the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus used this fact to conflict, uh, to perplex the Jews. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. They knew and understood that that term referred to uh, the Messiah. He said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies <coughs> under your feet. This was an enigma to the Pharisees and they had no solution to what they saw as a difficult riddle. Uh, he goes on, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Usually you didn't refer to your descendants as Lord, you referred to your uh, ancestors as Lord. Uh, and so this is not, and we'll talk about that again in a second, this is not the word that implies God did, uh, but it does imply that David's son would be greater than David, which would be uh, highly unusual for a, a man to say about his offspring. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor uh, from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. So they, they could not answer his will. Now Psalm 110 in verse 1, we see a uh, an answer to this. 
The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Again, the first word of the Lord, with all caps, is Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, which always refers to the one true and living God. The second word, Lord, is Adonai, which is a title of respect equivalent to our sir. In, uh, Spanish translations use Señor to translate this word. But it was inconceivable to the Jews that one would refer to his offspring as sir, or Lord, or Señor. It was always the other way around. Jesus had, present, had presented an enigma to the Jews that can only be solved by acknowledging that the Messiah was deity, and that's the sense in which Jesus was superior to his ancestor, David. He was deity as well as human. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are to, uh, too little to be among the uh, clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me uh, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now here's another one of those enigmatic prophecies uh, that they just missed. It's funny how they could miss it because they quoted it. When the wise men went to uh, King Herod, looking for the one who is to be born king of the Jews, Herod turns to his wise men and said, what is this? They said, oh yeah, Micah 5, 2. Micah 5, 2 talks about that. And so they read this verse to him. It prayed for simply another word for Judah. And so, yeah, uh, but what they missed and what is not quoted by Matthew, uh, perhaps is not what's quoted by the wise men of Herod, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days which explains that he would not be merely human, but he would be an eternal person, a member of the Godhead. In Matthew 2, verses 5 through 6, they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are my, by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So the chief scribes Herod gathered together, quoted this passage, uh, when the wise men came from the east looking for the one to be born king of the Jews, but they left off the final phrase. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, Now then, or know then, that this is the faith, that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. But in you is qualified later as in your offspring, which we've already seen Paul say uh, in verse 16, which is that we've already looked at, uh, that offspring was Jesus, Jesus Christ. And so, uh, here the word faith seems to me to be used in the sense of not our subject of faith in the gospel, but the faith, objectively, the New Testament, which God would and did reveal through the apostles and prophets. So in you was twofold, both physically and spiritually. In Abraham, physically to, with the land promise, but spiritually with reference to the uh, eternal purpose of God. So one must be spiritually mind, spiritually related to Abraham in Jesus by faith. Again, Galatians 3.16 Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring and it does not say to offsprings referring to many but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. Paul goes on, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years after. Now, God appeared to Abraham and said, In 400 years, I'm going to bring your people back over here. In 400 years, God raised up Moses. But remember, they, it took them uh, 400 years. Uh, it was actually 430 years. So uh, Moses was rounding it off there in, in, in Genesis 
But here it falls at 430 years between the promise made to Abraham and the, and the giving of the law. So the law which came 430 years after does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by law, it, is no, it no longer comes by promise, and God gave to Abraham by a promise. What he's saying is the law did not substitute the promise. We're not going to limit the, the fulfillment of these promises to those who are Abraham's physical descendants. Not even, not even the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, but uh, we're going to give it to the spiritual descendants of Abraham which is what Paul had already talked about there and talks about again here in the next few verses. Now before faith came, verses 23 through 29, now before faith, the faith, the New Testament, people had faith all down through history. You can read about that in Hebrews chapter 11. Before the faith, the New Testament came, we were held captive under the law, that is the Jews were. Imprisoned until the coming faith or covenant the new covenant, would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian, guardian, guardian of the Jews, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by the faith. They couldn't be fully justified by the law because the law was imperfect. It was not given for that purpose. Book of Hebrews talks a lot about that. And we won't, we won't go there because there just there'd be no stopping me if I did. Uh, but the word faith, I'm convinced, is preceded by the definite article, not faith, but the faith, as in Jude, verse 3. Contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Paul goes on to say, but now that faith, now that faith, or the faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, which was the, what the law of Moses was. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith, or the faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, those who did not accept the faith, the New Testament, they did not have faith in God. And so, though the faith is under consideration of the gospel, it still shows a lack of faith on the part of those Jews who had failed to embrace the gospel. And these, these Jews who failed to embrace the gospel, well, they were a source of consternation to the Jews and Gentiles who had obeyed the gospel, particularly in Galatians, in uh, Galatia, in Colossae, uh, in Philippi. Matter of fact, almost all of the epistles that we know Paul wrote, especially during his imprisonments, uh, he deals with that idea. Now here are these Judaizing teachers that are trying to bind on Gentiles and Jewish Christians. Uh, the law of Moses and the physical act of circumcision. But they did not, that was not required uh, by God. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, put on Christ. So that's how we get into Christ. That's how we get into a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Again, here's the, uh, not the singular, but the plural, actually probably collective sense here. Heirs according to promise. And so, the promise is not for physical descendants of Abraham. It's for the spiritual descendants of Abraham. He's the father of the faithful. And so the faithful are his spiritual uh, descendants. Galatians 4, 1 through 7. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, the child. But he is under guardians and managers until the debt set by his father. The child was not a... Uh, a free agent. What he had, what he had to look forward to, was in trust for him until he until he became until he came out of his minority, but ceased to be a minor and became a responsible adult. Then he would become 
uh, a possessor rather than just an heir. And so what he's saying is that the child is no better than the slave because the child does not have what he eventually is intended to have. Because he's under guardians and managers until the day set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Not only must Gentiles, but Jews, be born again. And when we are born again of water and spirit, we are adopted into the family of God. No longer. Now, under the old covenant, you were part of the, the, the nation of Israel by natural birth. But that is not the case with spiritual Israel. You can enter that only by spiritual birth, and you, then you are adopted as a, as a son. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave but a son, and a son than an heir through God. What he's saying is, you don't need physical circumcision. You don't need to keep the law of Moses. That was for the Jew while he was, uh, while he was still a child. It's been done away for the Jew. And it never did apply to the Gentile. And so there's no need for physical circumcision as a religious, uh, as a religious right or as a condition of salvation. In Galatians 4, verses 21 through 31, tell me you who desire to be under the law, this was what the Gentiles wanted because they thought this was what they needed. Do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. That's Ishmael. While the son of the free woman was born through promise, that's Isaac. Now this may be interpreted allegorically, that these women were our two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children of slavery, this is Hagar. It's interesting, and I just, somebody mentioned this the other day, and I hadn't thought about that. God uses a Canaanite slave to represent uh, Jewish uh, Judaism as it existed in the first century. And those who were uh, Ishmael represents those who are still trying to cling to that law for their salvation rather than turning loose of it and turning to Jesus Christ. And so, two, two women, two covenants. Hagar, the old covenant from Mount Sinai, but then he says, now Hagar in Mount Sinai is Arabia, in Arabia, but she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. And so those who have entered into Christ, they have received that which was entrusted in Christ for them, including eternal life, because they're in, in Christ. And and they've been begotten again by, by, their, by their mother, heavenly Jerusalem. That's where their citizenship is. Their citizenship is in heaven. And so they're free from the law. Uh, even those who were Jews were free from the law because of their relationship to Christ. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate, desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Uh, so, one who bear uh, a barren one who does not bear most likely refers to the fact that spiritual Israel was in the minority far too long, but with the preaching of the gospel, spiritual Israel began to increase. And so, on Pentecost Day, over three thousand people, Jews and proselytes, obeyed the gospel. And that was the beginning of spiritual Israel uh, in the New Testament. Not that there wasn't a spiritual Israel already 
All those who were in a faithful relationship with God during the patriarchal and Mosaic ages were part of spiritual Israel, but they were in the minority. But now they're going to be in the majority because God is soon going to make it impossible, soon at that time, make it impossible for a person to be a Jew uh, fully by destroying the city of Jerusalem, uh, the temple, uh, the records that could prove that one is a, a priest and therefore uh, from the tribe of Levi and qualified to be a priest. And so uh, those who are spiritual Israel will stand alone uh, without the uh, tribulation caused by those who were national Israel. Now you brothers are Isaac and children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. And so uh, the Galatians were very persecuted by the Jews who had refused to accept the faith, refused to enter into Christ, refused to become spiritual descendants of Abraham, and persecuting those who had become spiritual descendants of Abraham. And so, uh, that same thing has happened to you, which happened to Isaac uh, back in the old days. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. What you have had in the first century was Colossians who were faithful with him, extending fellowship to these Judaizing teachers who were not brethren at all in some, in some cases. And those who were brethren, they were not faithful with them because they were good men, trying to hold to the law and pressure the Gentiles into accepting uh, that law and giving in to the, uh, to the right of uh, the ceremonial right of uh, of circumcision. And they didn't need that. They had everything they needed in Christ. And they didn't need any of the things to be brought back uh, out, of, uh, out of the new old covenant. Uh, now, there were some things that are in both covenants. Uh, in Acts chapter 15 and again in Acts 21, we have uh, James, the brother of the Lord, saying to Paul, we uh, or Luke recording it, that we have sent them a letter to these Gentiles that they don't need to do anything about the law, but they do need to abstain from blood, they need to abstain from things uh, slaughtered, they need to uh, abstain from fornication. So there were some things that had been brought over into the new covenant, uh, but the ceremonial laws, including the Sabbath day uh, observance and physical circumcision, those were things of the past, and they need not be concerned about those things. If you need to make your heart right with God this morning, and only you know where well, you and God know whether you need to, uh, we encourage you to come while we stand.